Hello, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural debate in the Debates of Shem Shemaim series of uh, the Rabbinical Council of America in conjunction with its uh, journal tradition. Debate is unfortunately a wounded art in our time. In the general tenor of today, asserting one's views has given people the feeling that anything goes as long as my position wins. Name calling, vilifying, and rhetoric have replaced thoughtful presentation of ideas, and unfortunately, this extends to our Orthodox circle as well. Therefore, this project of debates l'shem shamayim, the purpose of this is to set an example of respectful debate, uh, thoughtful discussion, focusing on what is said, listening careful to each other's views, um, arguing forcefully against it but respectfully, and the hope is, in, in a modest way, that this will uh, present. The, a model of behavior while addressing today's current issues. The topic of today's debate is annexation. Should our community support Israel's annexations of parts of Yehuda and Shemron? Because this issue is, is, is an Israeli issue, we chose to speak to start with speakers who reside in Israel. While, of course, everyone can have a view on this issue regardless of where they live, there is a difference in perception from people who live in Israel because it, because it reflects their lived experience. And as such, we felt that it was appropriate to have speakers who resided in Israel. I, my name is Molly Brofsky. I'll be the moderator of the debate. I'm senior, I'm a director of the Fashanabet program at Mechalat Mavetar Yerushalayim, senior faculty member there, and have felt, held, held various academic and administrative positions. In addition, I hold a master's in social work from Wurzweiler and have a clinical private practice. Our other, our debaters today are Rabbi Professor Jeffrey Wolf an associate professor of in the Talmud department at Bar Ilan University, specializing in the history of halacha, medieval and Renaissance Jewish history, philosophy of Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, and the interaction between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Rabbi Wolf studied for nine and a half years under Rabbi Soloveitchik, from whom he received smicha in 1982, and he received his PhD in medieval Jewish history from Harvard University. Dr. Joel Finkelman is curator of the Chaim and Hannah Solomon Judaic Judaica Collection at the National Library of Israel. Formerly a lecturer at Bar Ilan University, Madrash at Lindenbaum, and MMY, he is the author of Strictly Kosher Reading, Popul Popular Literature and the Condition of Contemporary Orthodoxy, as well as numerous articles on contemporary religious culture in Israel and the United States. Okay, so let's get started. One more thing I want to say. Well, let me just give people the format. The format will be the following. Each side will present their view in 12 minutes. There will be no interruptions during these presentations. Then there will be rebuttal time, four minutes each for rebuttal. Then we'll have 10 minutes of engagement, questions and answers between the two speakers. I also want to just mention that the, we are not coming from a position, these are, this, is, this is not rabbinic psaq. Uh, my impression is that our two speakers are also not uh, military or governmental experts. This is really just a thoughtful dialogue between two thoughtful people of um, of substance and whose ideas are worth listening to. So with that being said, um, we're going to start alphabetically. And so, Dr. Finkelman, I would be happy to have you start by arguing the side opposed to annexation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Molly. Um, again, I want to uh, thank everybody for making this happen. And I want to reiterate um, what was just said, namely that um, I speak certainly not in the name of the National Library of Israel or in the name of my uh, professional or academic uh, work. I speak only in the name of uh, Israel Mudag, a concerned citizen, mm -hmm. as the saying goes uh, somewhat cynically here in Israel. Um, and I want to explain, uh, basically what I want to do is uh, begin by explaining what I'm not arguing um, and then actually make a claim about specifically why I think uh, annexation um, of uh, territories in Yudan Shemra on the West Bank is uh, not a good idea for Israel's best interest um, and why in the long term uh, we ought to be heading in a somewhat different direction and I'll try to make a claim uh, an argument in that um, direction. Um, I want to begin by saying, uh, first of all, that not everybody is terribly clear about what exactly this supposed annexation plan is. Um, so the word annexation is being used 
but does it mean uh, applying Israeli law to territories that are not currently uh, formally part of the state of Israel? Full annexation, something in between. What territories are, are we talking about? Uh, also, the Jordan Valley, only heavily populated uh, Jewish cities. Um, all of these questions haven't really been fleshed out. And if you've been following the news for the last couple of days, you realize that there are plenty of rumors suggesting that both the United States government and the Israeli government is less enthusiastic uh, are less enthusiastic about uh, annexation than they were only a couple of weeks ago. That having been said, um, I don't want to argue that Yudan Shamron, uh, the West Bank, is Palestinian land. Um, I do not want to argue that Jews have no legitimate claim on this territory. Of course, we do. Um, I do not want to argue that uh, if we just make the right moves, peace will be on the horizon and a new Middle East will rise uh, before us. Um, I certainly do not want to make uh, silly claims about the possibility of a multinational state living in peace and harmony, everybody together. Uh, and I assume everybody understands what the subtext of that uh, is. Um, uh, I um, do want to claim I also want to acknowledge that many Palestinians and much of Palestinian leadership are simply put our enemies um, uh, who would be more than happy uh, to kill uh, Jews in Israel, uh, outside of Israel, uh, anywhere. They are quite explicit about that and they have translated words into actions. Um, uh, I certainly don't think in all of this that settlements are per se uh, immoral or uh, we have no business doing them. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea. Uh, and I don't think it's a good idea uh, in, in a, the language I'm going to use is somewhat reminiscent of, except without the vitriol and I hope without the overstatements of Yishayahu Leibovitz. Uh, namely that what he's concerned about is Israel, he's concerned about Israeli democracy, he's concerned about Israeli morality, he's concerned about the long-term implications for us of uh, holding on to uh, territory. Um, I'm not coming from a great place of sympathy for the Palestinian side or, or suggesting that they're innocent. Um, they are to a very significant degree responsible for the uh, very difficult uh, situation that they are in. Um, so what I do want to claim by arguing that um, that annexation is potentially a data point, uh, another step in the direction of something that I see as uh, dangerous and problematic for Israel as a Jewish state. And I'm going to go to a trope that many people have used and suggested over the course of the years. And despite it being somewhat oversimplified, I actually think it's a good heuristic to think about the situation of Israel in Yudan Shemron, uh, the West Bank. Um, the heuristic goes as follows. There are three things that Israel wants, and it can have any two of them, but it can't have all three. Uh, Israel can be a Jewish state by which I do not mean a state of halakha, medinat halakha. I don't mean any particularly essentialist definition of what a Jewish state is. I mean a state with a clear Jewish majority in which Jewish cultural interests, language, calendar is uh, part of the public square, is part of the public conversation, uh, is comfortable, uh, is the kind of thing uh, you would absorb uh, from the cultural atmosphere. Um, and I, again, I don't mean a Jewish state by any particularly legislative or halachic or Torah definition. I just mean a state with a majority of Jews uh, who see uh, a state of a state with a majority of Jews as a culturally uh, valuable thing. I would like that state to be pluralistic, um, not because I don't have opinions about what Judaism is normatively. I do have such opinions, but. I'd like this Jewish state to be live and let live. So one of the things that Israel wants, or that Zionism wants, is a Jewish state. Um, the second thing that Zionism wants, uh, I think, or that Israel wants and would benefit from is democracy. Uh, and by democracy, I mean not only formal kinds of 
uh, of election of leadership, uh, changes of elected leadership uh, uh, every so often. Um, I don't just mean the formal structures of democracy. I mean, here I do mean something a little more uh, essentialist, uh, by which I mean a country uh, that is uh, governed by the people who uh, live in that country. Five minute, um, warning. The, hmm? <laughs> Five minute warning. Five minute warning. Okay, I'm good. Um, uh, the other thing that Israel has found itself, or at least much of Israel has found itself wanting, the third thing is uh, continued and ongoing security and civilian presence in uh, territories that were conquered in 1967 and are not by law part of the state of Israel. And a necessary correlation of that desire to have a military and civilian presence in sacred Jewish land in the land of Israel is control over roughly 2.5 million people uh, who are non-citizens. Um, and they may be non-citizens because they voted, their leadership voted against the partition plan uh, in 1947, maybe because they were actively uh, involved in military uh, and terrorist attacks against Jews and Zionists. But as a matter of simple uh, fact, 2.5 million people, roughly the Arab population of, uh, of Yudan Shomron, um, uh, are under Israeli, practically speaking, control and are not citizens uh, of the country. Um, they have only certain kinds of limited uh, autonomous rights that they've gotten with, uh, with Oslo and, and certain measures of Palestinian mm -hmm. autonomy. Israel can choose to have any two of those three, but it can't choose to have all three. If it wants to be uh, have continued to maintain control over 2.5 million non-citizens, then it will not be a democracy and it will not be a Jewish state um, because it will have a such a large Palestinian minority, if not at some point majority, that it will cease to be the kind of Jewish state that I think Zionism ought to go for. It can no longer control those 2.5 million uh, citizens, but then it is only a democracy and a Jewish state and does not have control over these historically, culturally, and religiously valuable territories. Or it can be at least formally a democracy and have control over these 2.5 million people and not be a Jewish state. I don't think I did that in the right order, but I think I got all the possibilities. Um, uh, I think that that's a pretty straightforward um, um, description of of kind of the reality that we live in. Um, and of course, hovering over all of this is security, which is why, frankly speaking, I'm pretty despondent, um, meaning I don't think that there's any realistic way of achieving peace. And since there's no realistic way of achieving peace in the near future, I can't see an effective withdrawal from any of these territories um, uh, that are not formally part of the state of Israel today uh, without paying an enormous security price like rocket fire over Ben Gurion Airport, which only a few short months ago was open for business. Um, and we'd like to see it open for business again. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think that that more or less leads at least me to the conclusion that taking steps like annexation or expanding Israeli law, formally declaring part of this territory as um, as part of Israel, um, but not granting citizenship to its Palestinian residents inevitably results in us no longer being the, uh, the only democracy in the, middle, in the Middle East. Now, somebody could, I think, reasonably say, well, if I can pick two of those three, I'm not going to pick democracy. Um, and I could hear somebody making that claim. I'm not going to make that claim simply because democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. Um, and, uh, and also because I think that the long-term moral, political, uh, and cultural price of maintaining control over 2.5 million people who don't want us to be controlling them is going to genuinely rot us to the both internationally and morally. And that's not a result that I want to see happen. So given those two or three, I'd, la I'd rather us be a Jewish state and a democracy without control over those territories. And I don't think that annexation pushes us in that direction, although I'm not quite sure how we could get to that direction from a security perspective. Thank you very much. That was actually perfect timing. Um, Professor, <laughs> you got there with, it, with 32 seconds to spare.
Wow. Professor Wolf, yeah. Uh, let's hear the let's hear the argument in support of annexation. I, well, as I as I as I as I strongly suspected when um, when uh, when I heard that y'all was going to be the person I was going to be discussing this with, uh, the distance between the two of us is not all that huge um, in terms of, in terms of many of the points that he raised. Uh, it certainly is true that the um, we have no that when we talk about all these things we uh, we have no idea what's going to be. It's like what the Rambam said about Achrite Amim. I may go back to Ashkenazis. Nobody's going to know how it's going to be until it's going to be because there are so many different options and so many things that are floating around and rumors and leaks that we don't even know really what we're talking about. And we might not be talking about anything except a theoretical discussion, which is also important. Um, the um, I think that there are a couple of things that I want to start off with. Number one, um, I think that the use of the word annexation is absolutely is not is not appropriate uh, because the word and you want to annex is territories that don't belong to you or to which you have no legitimate claim. Uh, if you have a legitimate claim, the proper uh, term is to uh, express or to assert or extend sovereignty or to extend Israeli law, uh, which means basically you're, you've chosen to. Um, to actualize or to realize your uh, legitimate legal claims. Uh, that's number one. And uh, I'm not going to go into a whole lecture about the San Remo conference and the whole deb debate about the international law, but Israel has a very strong case for that. So it's, I prefer not using the word annex. Uh, that would be playing into those who argue in general that we have no legitimate uh, claim on Yudav Shomron, or, by the way, to any, any part of the state of Israel that was outside the 1947 uh, partition borders. Because the truth of the matter is that the same mechanism that would be used um, if uh, if uh, sovereignty is extended was what Ben Gurion uh, used in order to be able to incorporate those parts of uh, pre -ma of mandatory Eretz Israel uh, into the state that were conquered by the army when the war ended and when the War of Independence ended in 1949. Um, as far as um, as far as the the plan to um, to add these areas to the sovereign state of Israel. Um, Assuming that we have a very strong uh, moral and history, historical and legal case for it, um, I don't. Uh, the issue of um, of democracy, um, I think, is the central is the central consideration. I would love to have another conversation about what democracy means because I think that um, we really have to hash out the question of what uh, uh, Justice Barak calls uh, substantive versus formal democracy. I think that's. Uh, that's a conversation we have to have, but not, it's not for right now, I don't think. Um, number one, I don't see that the, um, I don't see that, that, that adding to the sovereign state of Israel or adding Jewish law to um, the Jordan Valley, to the uh, major settlement, um, settlement uh, blocks, to uh, connecting Malay Dumim to Jerusalem is going to have any, any serious um, impact on the demographics uh, of the state of Israel. On the contrary, the way that, as, as my friend Shmuel Rosner mentioned in a column that he published in a couple of places, actually, in the last couple of weeks, um, by us simply uh, incorporating those parts of those parts of Eretz Israel, which everybody agrees is going to be ours anyways, into the state, we are basically going to, hopefully, we could very well be breaking up the logjam and saying, look, we are ready to define our borders. We are ready to take a stand and say, this is going to be sovereign Israel, and we will work out something with the with the Palestinians in terms of their own, um, in terms of their own um, autonomy or whatever the case, whatever the case might be. Um, the um, by the way, I personally uh, think it would it's only moral to uh, into the degree that Palestinians will be included in those. Uh, in, the, in those actions by a uh, punitive by the government in the future, they have got to be, those Palestinians have got to be given a um, route to citizenship. There's no such thing as being in the sovereign state of Israel and not being a citizen. So that um, so that that has to be part of the part of the deal. We are not talking. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking anyways about um, about wholesale. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, inclusion of areas A and uh, B. Um, as divided by the Oslo Accords into the, into um, into the sovereign state of Israel. Now that's number one. Number two. Now what would now what will be the final disposition of the Palestinians? That depends on the Palestinians and depends on us. And as much as it depends on us. Um, here uh, I will appeal to a little bit to to uh, stuff that I do and get involved with an academic le level. Um, you need to be able to have some kind of arrangement. 
the um, there has to be a switch on the other side where the law of return and where the illegitimacy of, um, of any, any Jewish Vimy Kafir presence uh, on the land of Israel um, is totally denied. There's nothing to talk about at that at that point. So basically, we're doing this to try to loosen things up, but also to do it for ourselves. And why for ourselves? Because the situation in Yudav Shomron at the moment is absolutely insane in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of municipal planning. This, 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 is, this affects the Palestinians also in terms of allocation of water rights, in terms of gas allocations, in terms of electricity, and the fact that nobody knows who runs anything over here. For the simple, uh, I mean, the officially, uh, the government doesn't run doesn't run things that, that go on Yuvah Shomron. The army does, but the army does it through it through it through through an organization called the Minhal, the uh, administration, which isn't really responsible to anybody. And as in the case of a lot of Pennsylvania paper pushers, it, nothing ever gets done. I mean, it's Israel, anyways. But this is like Israel on steroids in terms of getting anything anything accomplished. Um, include um, ex, uh, applying Israeli law to the uh, to the settlement blocks and to Greater Jerusalem and to, and to the Arab up to Malay Dumim will in fact improve the ability not only of um, of Israeli citizens who live in the Shuvim, um, but also the Palestinians who would work here and who um, with whom we have good relations. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that um, as opposed to a lot of people I know who oppose this, I actually know. <laughs> a lot of Palestinians and um and and uh you know they're they're sort of bemused they're not sure what to what to make of um at least my friends uh of what of of this of this move um one of the things I have to say is the fact that one of the greatest things we could do for them is get them away from the Palestine Authority which is a rapacious mafia-like organization and uh, I can I can give chapter and verse for that but not now five minutes five minutes um, and it, so it's really so the question of democracy I don't think really comes up um, I think that um, one thing I have noticed um, one thing I've noticed uh, in the discussions of this potential move um, by uh, by the Israeli government over the past number of months since the um, American proposal was was set forward is that what you hear uh, a in social media B, what you hear on the American side of the Atlantic and what you hear over here are totally, totally different things. Many of the people who are arguing against Israel making this move are not doing it out of concern for, uh, are not doing it out of the concern for Israel uh, the way that Yoel presented it and which I, and concerns that I share, but as an Israeli and we're friends, um, but because there is an increasing um, buy-in by American Jews, especially American Jewish intellectuals, of the Palestinian, um, of the Palestinian, and the and the leftist uh, uh, narrative to the degree to the extent that Israel actually has no not only has no rights to claim uh, or to realize in the Yudav Shamron, but uh, in general has no right to, really should be uh, dismantled. There are many. The question is not. Um, I'll mention the shame of Forish. Uh, there's not a question of Peter Beinart and um, and what he actually wrote. Mm -hmm. And who said who was in favor and who bemoaned it? The question is how many people are sitting around their coffee tables or their dinner tables, going, you know, he's really right. Which uh, and the piece um, and the, and and that kind of that kind of hostility towards our very existence is actually clouds the ability to have a uh, straightforward or even constructive discussion about um, about the question of um, of extending our rule. But on the same token, of finally making breaking breaking the um, Breaking the consensus in order to be able to try to mix things up, and um, and, and to find and to move towards some kind of a uh, some kind of a solution. Interestingly, the Palestinians are now saying that if Israel does this, then that they before that they want to talk. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Um, finally, I just throw in one last one last thing, which is totally unrelated. Totally unrelated to what we set up until now, but I really have to mention um, this whole business started with a discussion about um, declaring Israeli sovereignty in the Jordan Valley. Uh, and the, the north, of the north of the uh, Dead Sea, and the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley, under no circumstances, can ever for Israel to survive, can ever be in hands that could potentially be either neutral or hostile. That would mean the destruction of the state of Israel. This is something that goes all the way back from to the, to the Alone Plan, which was advanced explicitly by Yitzhak Rabin, and um, and, where, and there were very few. Palestinians who lived there, but if you Jews, if anybody's been there knows it's because it's hot as hell there. But um, that has to be beyond 
uh, any kind of uh, any kind of discussion because anybody who knows the Jordan Rift Valley knows, and the and the and the Jordanians know it as well. So if they're making noise, it's because they uh, have to make noise. They know that they cannot, under any circumstances, allow for that to happen either, or else they'll be cooked. Okay, one other time. Thank you very much. Uh, as you both said, um, less of a debate and more of a thoughtful uh, dialogue, I would say, between two people. Um, the next part, we're going to give you each to uh, respond. I don't even know if the word rebuttal fits, but perhaps it does. Um, and I just want to mention to our anybody who's watching on Facebook, this might be an opportunity for, uh, if you have any questions for either one of our panelists, just write them in on the Facebook Live. I will take a look at them and um, hopefully forward some of them after the rebuttal type. So this might be a time to think and, and formulate some questions. Okay, so Dr. Finkelman, response. Okay, so I'll try to make it uh, a pretty direct response uh, such that we can check off the box that says actual debate. But two right. very quick things that I want to get out of the way. Um, I don't think that this will succeed in defining our borders any more clearly. It will just shift one border and we're, we're kicking that can down. Nobody knows what our permanent borders might be. I agree for security reasons, the Jordan Valley is a very complicated issue, but this isn't gonna define any borders. Um, and it's gonna loosen up the log jam for Israeli bureaucracy within Israeli settlements, which is a valuable thing. Israeli bureaucracy is notorious and it's not nearly as bad as its reputation, but, but what's the geopolitical price and what's the moral price of easing up the bureaucracy for Jews living in Efrat or Har Bracha? Uh, or what will be. The core thing that I really want to argue is is that uh, Rabbi Dr. Wolf mentioned this idea that it doesn't really affect democracy. And I can kind of see that, but I want to push back against it because when you when any of the maps or any of the of the ways in which they've been drilling down the details of what this hypothetical annexation slash sovereignty might look like, um, it's always about drawing that map such that Jews are in and Arabs are out. And as a data point in, uh, in this long story of us continuing to control millions of people who don't want our control, that kind of annexation has everything to do with democracy. It's a way of saying loud and clear, Jews are citizens, Arabs who live under our control are not. And maybe that's a price we have to pay at the moment for security considerations, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking that that's democratic. It's not. Okay. Okay. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, the, um, the, uh, the truth of the matter is that the, the idea that there'll be Jews will in and, and Arabs out because the, ultimately we hope that some kind of, some of us hope that some kind of Arab self-rule with uh, whatever uh, with whatever kind of sovereignty um, we can allow for uh, will happen, and it's very it's that uh, it's that simple. And if and if the um, and if the they and if and if it's a group like the PLO or Hamas, which is even worse, takes over, if they vote them in, that's their that's the, that was their decision. The it was the Arabs of Aza who voted Hamas into office. And uh, and not anybody else. So you you pick your uh, you you know you vote for whom you get. And you that's what you end up with. If they wanted to vote out, to take over. If they wanted to throw Hamas out, they could do it. There were enough people with with all kinds of with all kinds of arms. So in in, in Aslan, the same thing could happen here. That's number one. Number two, um, nobody. And the whole point. To, and let me add to that. The whole point of this exercise is that the Palestinian Arabs not be part of the state of Israel, they be part of some type of other kind of entity. The problem is at the moment, and security is the issue because Palestinian culture, I, I think it's actually Islam, but Palestinian culture is such that if we, that were we to do anything more than is, uh, than is envisioned right now, uh, would be absolutely suicidal. Um, because even though there are shifts that it can be that can be uh, seen on the horizon quietly, uh, M M Michael Melchior likes to talk about the many many Arab um, uh, and Muslim leaders that he meets with who tell him all kinds of things that are so wonderful and that we can really make let make peace with the Jews, but they would never open their mouths to say that because they would be killed, or worse. Um, worse means your families would be killed as well. So that we're not in a situation where anything more than that can be done. If we can, if we can begin to regularize our status, that's already and say what we don't want and who we don't want, that we don't intend to rule over all uh, the, that entire Palestinian population, then uh, then that's actually a step in the right direction. 
Uh, finally, the um, the uh, the fact that um, as far as the fallout for the from the rest of the world is concerned, yes, the Europeans will scream and yell. Uh, as far as our neighbors are concerned, I have uh, I rather suspect yes, it's a chance. But I rather suspect that our neighbors are far more concerned about Iran, who we are apparently certainly in, we're apparently working together with them to control um, the attempts to create the recreate the Achaemenid Empire uh, throughout the Middle East uh, with the assistance of uh, nuclear weapons. So that I don't think that in in terms of our geopolitical standing, it's really going to make uh, all that much of a difference, especially since we're talking about only. Um, express uh, um, exercising Israeli sovereignty over areas that um, almost everyone has agreed is uh, are going to remain part of the state of Israel, anyways. Okay, very good. All right, so I'm just checking if we have questions. Um, well, okay. Well, I, what I'm going to ask you. Because I'll read you one thing. I don't know if you guys can see it. Have there been any concrete plans as to what to do with those who will be uprooted from their homes if annexation were to move forward? I mean, it's not really clear to me who's are people being going to be uprooted for their homes. I'm not sure no, what that question no, is referring nobody to. Knows. I, right, I, not from the Jewish population or from the Arab population. Yeah, no. Any plan? Um, I also think that what, what, what that shows us is. Um, that also we, we don't have so much clarity about what the plan itself is, which I think is it's, it's like we're all, all kind of a little talking in the dark because it, it's really not clear what we're talking about. And and even to the people who it is clear what they're talking about, when they talk about it, they seem to be talking about different things. Um, By the way, I would I would just yeah. add that one of the one of the one of the forces that came out and said that they want everything uh, that they that they're opposed to the plan are the uh, is the um, is the Yesha parts of the Yesha Council right for whom. For whom any any kind of compromise is absolutely not acceptable. I am certainly not there. Right. Um, I think that I, I um, the late Arthur Hertzberg, who I really didn't agree with on almost almost everything, uh, called that the politics of irrationality. I, I think that's absolutely okay. Excellent. So the truth is here. I have here's a question. Uh, um, if America, and then I want to get back actually to what you just said, Professor Wolf. But let's ask this question first. If American Jewry is moving away from support of Israel, isn't annexation now accelerating this process? Which um, Interestingly, I think we heard more from Professor Wolf than we did from Dr. Finkelman, right? I didn't, I didn't, unless I missed it, hear Dr. Finkelman say he's expressed concern about that at all. Professor Wolf um, expressed concern about that, but it didn't necessarily serve as a stumbling block to your desire to apply sovereignty. But um, any other comments about that question, right? Meaning this question is coming from the perspective of if we do this, aren't we going to be pushing away support? from this specifically says American Jewry, right? You could also add, you know, the American public or certain, certainly certain parts of the American political body. So any responses to that from either one of you? Yeah, so so two things related to that. First, let me go back to the, the Yesha Council and, and the politics of irrationality. Um, I think that that a little bit undercuts uh, Dr. Wolf's talking about the idea that what we're trying to do is, is gain some clarity and make a declaration that we want to control Jews, but we don't want to control them. And we imagine some future in which they're going to have increased uh, control, if not outright statehood. I don't think that there is anybody in the Israeli right, which at the moment is really the dominant right and center right, are the dominant forces in Israeli politics. I don't see any concrete action that's leading toward an eventuality in which we say, uh, yeah, we really want you to be autonomous and take over your own lives. Um, we don't want to you control you. Uh, yeah, you let, me, let me just finish the, the, the Israeli yeah. right is split on that. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah but uh, they're split on it, I think, at the level of, uh, of, of talk and theory. But in practice, you know, nobody's you saying, they don't want, nobody's they saying, want oh, those... Or yeah, I think that there's a very her. significant voice in the right, which, you know, the the center right political leadership cannot afford to alienate or Netanyahu might be learning the price right now of try, of alienating those further to his right. But, uh, you know, there's many, many people in the Israeli right who envision uh, the status quo uh, or something like it as being permanent. Mm -hmm. I think that they're also that's the politics of irrationality. But I think there are certainly voices who see that. I think the net result is is a one state uh, and non-Jewish state and an ongoing conflict. I don't see how that works out well. As far as the American Jewish left, I imagine Dr. Wolf will roughly agree with me that uh, we're losing them. Uh, there are things that we could do potentially to slow it down. Uh, there are things that we could do to speed it up. 
but I don't think that we are the primary cause uh, or that we're, you know, I think the con the conversation about Israel and the American left tells us a great deal about the American left. It doesn't tell us much about the Middle East. I'll okay. add that I just I just yeah. actually printed out a an article by uh, Aryeh Edre and um, Doran Meisels from Tel Aviv. Uh, they have a series of articles in which they study asking a very simple question about what um, what happened to the approximately seven eight million Jews in the Roman Empire at the time of the uh, destruction of the Temple. Uh, they seem to have fallen off the face of the earth, and they make a very, very cogent case that it was the lack of the lack of Jewish literacy that ultimately um, ultimately led to their disappearing over the course of the hundred years after the Horban. Uh, so and this is the alienation from Israel and, the th and Jewish ethnicity and national and national identity is 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 a deeper deeper problem there, and it's not as as you all said. I would add in terms of the um, just in terms of in terms of the Israeli right, I, th I don't I don't agree. I think that there is a lot, large sector of the Israeli right, uh, certainly center right, that is um, will be pained to the nth to to not rule all of over all of Eretz Israel. But by the same token, realizes that um, you know that, that is in favor of some. Could they have the Arabs rule themselves? The problem with full sovereignty is that at the moment in the con cultural construct that exists, it's lethal for us. So it's, it's somebody, somebody, somebody compared it once to holding a wild lion. You're holding, you're holding its mouth closed. You can't let it go and you can't, and you can't close it either. I mean, you're, you're, you're and that's to a certain degree that where we, uh, where we are now, a lot of people, extremists on both sides make it difficult to be able to get out of that situation. But, um, and sometimes, uh, I, I, and I do understand you uh, Despondency, or dis what do you say? Despondency, despair. I don't know which yeah, word. Yeah, despondency. Be, whatever. But yeah. it's it's. But you know, uh, one of the uh, one of the problems with uh, one of the problems with living in a in a um, in an internet world is the fact that uh, we lose what um, actually a lot of Arabs still have, and that's what the ability to live, work, play for the long game. So you need a lot of patience, you need a lot of amuna. I mean, that's. Um, I know you're not supposed to talk religion because more is a rabbit. No, no. No, but you have to have. You have to have a lot of amuna, and as my and as my kids always point out, everything nothing nothing works here on on normal according to normal rules. So okay, so so I want to ask a question that that kind of relates to the last thing you said. So so there are a couple questions for you, Dr. Wolf. Does Dr. Wolf believe that there is any way that the Palestinians might put together a moderate government during the four years allowed by the plan? And I think that question is, if I understand correctly, kind of asking. The question you both alluded to theoretically: Where's the support on the right? Where's the support on the left? Or, you know, so I'm going to ask it to you guys personally, even though again, you it's not at all like uh, Dr. Finkelman is a classic uh, rep representative of the left wing view, and Dr. Wolf is a classic classic representative of the white right wing view. But um, this was a question that we thought of before the debate that I thought was interesting to ask both of you personally. It's kind of you know. Okay, let me read the question. Would you be happy with a Palestinian state on 70% of Yehuda Shomron? Would you feel that this, is, that this is a stage in our hope to have the entire land? Or would you feel a Jewish state on part of the land is satisfying religiously but while being short of the entire land? Reading, I think the, the thrust behind that question is, let, let's, yes, move this into, again, not, I'm not asking for a benedict sock, but I am asking for theological consideration. How do you feel about the idea of 70% sovereignty and i think that's part of uh, this question that that's being asked here like okay put your money where your mouth is if if the palestinians do get their act together and put together a reasonable idea where they get the other parts of the land how would you feel about that so i'll, I'll start with you dr wolf because it was kind of i would i'd like okay. to hear dr. So as well. I, an, that god promised us both sides of the jordan just like the san remo agreement promised us both sides of the jordan and any part of Eretz Israel that we don't control is, I would feel like it cut off, had it cut off my arm. Um, it's that, and, and it's that intense, it's not a square inch that, that is not associated with, that is not part of our Moledit. Um, if, um, if, it's a very big if, if some way it could be found to uh, allow Palestinian autonomy, demilitarized autonomy, um, in, um, Around seventy percent of Yudav I would, um, I would, be, I would be pained to death. Um, but I would, at the same time, uh, see it as an opportunity. 
I believe ultimately the Rabbana Shalom will, will make sure that we rule all of Eretz Yisrael. I have no doubt in my mind. Um, however, we have paid a very, very serious price um, for the uh, Hityashvut, which I support. I live in, I live in Yishuv. Um, and no, we're not, a, but this is not Scarsdale on the, uh, on the Jordan, the way that some people wanted to say. Um, but we have paid a very high price. And part of that price is in the self-isolation of the religious community, uh, the Dati Lumi community, that community which is supposed to have bridged all the different parts of Israeli society. And as a result, we are faced with a situation in which um, the, um, the, we're, we're faced in the middle of a cultural war uh, over wh- exactly how Jewish the country should be. In other words, while we were busy settling the Davish the, um, the rest of the country became, uh, part of the country became much more Jewish. But that part of the country, which was marginally Jewish, has become virulently anti-Jewish. And I don't mean anti-religious, I mean anti-Jewish. To the extent that anything Jewish that it happens anywhere is opposed as being religiously coercive. And that, for that development, I blame the postmodern West, which, is, uh, which, which invades every corner like, uh, like as it does with everyone else. But also I blame ourselves because we have lost the ability to have a common cultural language, to be able to mediate Torah. And if we ultimately believe, as I think we have to believe, that, our, that as uh, Rav Soloveitchik used to say, that uh, our right to the land of Israel is absolute, our certificate of residence is dependent on our God-good behavior, then, um, then we have an, we, that we have made, we have, we, have to, uh, we have to begin to work to shore ourselves up in those areas of Eretz Yisrael that we do, that we do have to increase Shemiras Mitzvahs, to increase Harbatzah's Torah, uh, and so on and so forth. So that how you balance that, so therefore we're talking about democratic, uh, in reference to what Yoel said, I said it's another conversation, um, that what, is, what presently is considered substantive democracy in the West, in fact, on many issues, uh, collides head on with uh, even the most um, the most generous interpretation of Torah, and that's something which we have to deal with, and which I think ultimately will make the decision whether Rabbi Shalom, uh, how much the Rosh Shalom protects us and supports us in our efforts to return to our country. Okay, so uh, I, from what from what you just said, I'm I understood that the answer is you would support seventy percent. Support it, but with a tremendous amount of pain. Right, because you believe that that's uh, that that there are all kinds of other factors as you. Correct. So eloquently described. Okay, so the, Rabbi Finkelman. Um, okay. Our time is at an end. So, Yoel. Yoel. Um, I, I'm going to give you the last word. I'd like to okay. To this. I want to just wait. So I want to just finish up by saying um, there are a lot of great questions here that we're not going to have the time to answer. Um, you can, you guys can take a look at them on Facebook yourselves later and maybe figure out a way to respond. But yeah, um, I'd be, really be happy to hear your response. And I want to sharpen it by asking you one more thing because when you said, "Well, what do we gain?" by applying sovereignty, right? And you kind of echo Dr. Wolf and you said, okay, so there'll be less bureaucratic, um, um, you know, red tape perhaps to cut through because right now a citizen, you didn't say this, I'm saying this, the citizen of Yehudah Shomron is an Israeli citizen, but their land is not Israeli land and it's all very complicated. But what I w- wanted to ask you at the time is, well, is that all we would gain by applying sovereignty? Is there a piece of, is there a piece of you that would say, no, applying sovereignty is good because you know, the, the, I would say what the right t- generally says, which is our our relationship with this land is this is our land, and so therefore strengthening our political. I'm not talking about you know an I- ideological perspective, but from a, just from a practical perspective, strengthening our hold on the land if it can come with a reasonable price, that's worth something as well. So giving uh, with that. As part of you, you know, that, that, not, you've said that, that more eloquently than I than so, I did. So, yeah. So That's so right. now so, you want yeah. me to deal with a uh, Palestinian state on seventy percent of the land, cultural wars in the postmodern West, and the question exactly. of what we gain theologically. And I've got what ninety seconds. <laughs> well, you, can, you can take. I'll give you five minutes. I'll, I'll do At the least. best I can. Yeah. Um, I would be. Let me begin at the beginning. Um, I don't quite speak religiously and Zionistically the same language as as either Jeffrey or Molly uh, just used. And I don't know if that's because I don't even have it in my kishkas anymore or just because since I play the role of leftist iconoclast in so many circles that it's that it's been uh, that it's atrophied. Um, but I don't speak the language of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's plans. I don't speak the language mm-hmm. of religious value in sovereignty per se. I am uh, uh, really trying to be as politically and Zionistically pragmatic as possible. If there was a realistic possibility of a 
Palestinian state on 70%, on 90% of the land in the West Bank, on the equivalent of 100% with land swaps in another area, if there was a realistic possibility, and I emphasize the word realistic possibility of genuine security under those circumstances, I would grab it in a minute and I would celebrate. Um, mm -hmm. There would be a Tzvita Balev, there would be a certain uh, uh, um, pain, but I would not feel like I was cutting off an arm. I am thankfully thankful enough for what we have in the state of Israel um, and the sea change between, uh, you'll pardon the melodrama, 1945 and 1948, that I can live without that land and, and the Kaddish Baruch is going to do what he wants. Um, I don't, so um, I, I uh, uh, Jeffrey went off in a direction about cultural war and post-Western, you know, post-modern West and, and anti-Jew. I disagree about virtually all of those sentences and don't have enough time to get into it. Anyway, it's another conversation. Other, right. Yeah, other than, other than, as, as you know very well, I think we need to scratch the word postmodern from the religious right. Zionist lexicon. Um, most of the people who use it, present company accepted, have absolutely no idea what it means and wouldn't, uh, you know, and wouldn't identify postmodernism if, if it hit them across the face. It's just a bugaboo. It's just all the bad stuff in the West that we don't like and we're anxious about. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a cultural war. I think there's a cultural war on some newspapers and among some spokesmen, which is magnified by Twitter and Facebook. Um, mm. I don't think there's a cultural war. I think there's a lot of shared ground among a plurality of people. Um, I, I, uh, don't, I don't uh, agree. That's what Shmuel right. Rosner's. So, so there's uh, the, there's another deeper conversation um, to be. And and I don't I don't yeah. and I agree with with uh, with Dr. Wolf that we, that religious Zionism has paid a price for the settler movement. I don't think if it ever was that bridge that it imagined itself as. Uh, if you'll permit me, just like the conversation of the American left, uh, it tells you more about the American left than it does about the Middle East. The conversation within religious Zionism mm -hmm. about secular Zionism often tells you more about religious Zionism than it does about the rest of Zionism. Um, and and the rhetoric of this bridge, I often you know think is, is, is rhetoric, um, but the religious Zionist movement has made it, you know, broadly made a decision to, to put it to live in, in isolated communities. I do. It has a lot of advantages. Um, but but as you know, as as Jeffrey mentioned, there's a huge cultural price uh, to pay for that. Uh, so but just to get us really back to our original topic, yes, I would be very, very happy mm -hmm. at the founding of a Palestinian state on whatever land would make that possible and uh, and keep us reasonably secure. Okay. Well I First of all, I want to thank you both for a very um, rich and engaging conversation. I want to thank the RCA. I want to thank Tradition for this opportunity. I hope that it uh, continues. I hope we continue to have dialogue such as this. I think that um, whether or not there is a cultural war going on, um, I, I, I would imagine that we can all agree that we are all impoverished by the, uh, the, the devolvement of civil discourse. And I think the attempt to engage in civil discourse is extremely valuable and we should grab it whenever we can. And so therefore, I want to thank you both for participating in this conversation. I want to thank, thank you for you. watching and um, may this continue into the future. And thank Amen. you both very much.